убежден, что решение проблемы наркопроизводства лежит в организации социально-экономического подъема через создание инфраструктур следующего поколения, которые технологически в состоянии обеспечивать доступ основной части населения государств к современному мировому качеству жизни. Именно в создании инфраструктур нового поколения не с ограниченным доступом, а всеобщего пользования лежит существенный ответ на планетарный вызов наркопроизводства. Речь должна идти о новой индустриализации, где основным источником и локомотивом общественного богатства станут новые технологии и инфраструктуры. При этом на службу национального развития должны ставиться все имеющиеся у государства природные ресурсы. Здесь Аргентина может служить образцом. Об этом свидетельствуют такие шаги, как принятие закона о углеводородном суверенитете Аргентины и экспроприации 51% в IPF, принадлежащей испанской нефтяной компании Repsol. Как раз идут в направлении организации условий для национального развития. Это по себе является серьезным вкладом в денаркотизацию и декриминализацию. Именно развитие обеспечивает подлинный суверенитет, прежде всего, что касается планетарных центров наркопроизводства, суверенитета государств от их глобальной эксплуатации со стороны транснациональной преступности, в которой целые государства и группы государств беспощадно превращают своего рода наркофермы глобальной преступности. Мир сегодня стоит перед необходимостью ухода от больной неолиберальной экономики владящей неравенство и наркотизацию земли и перехода к новой социально-экономической модели развития. Виктор Ivanov's choice of Argentina as the place to make his latest call for a new financial architecture was not accidental. It is consistent with the spirit of enthusiasm for genuine economic development shared by Russia and Argentina. As we'll hear in a moment, Ivanov also took the occasion to amplify his own call for the Glass-Steagall principle, the strict separation of bank lending for legitimate economic purposes from all types of financial speculation and criminal money flows. Ivanov had first launched this polemic before a Washington, D.C. audience in November 2011. Now, coinciding with his call in Argentina for a new financial architecture, a further major breakthrough was already underway in quite a different location. An important faction in the British establishment was about to publicly announce their decision to support a Glass-Steagall reform to restructure the banking system. The upsurge of support for instituting Glass-Steagall is a change in dynamics that shifts the entire political economic playing field. If Glass-Steagall is reenacted on a global scale and the gaping loopholes in the financial system are stitched up, we will be able to solve a myriad of conflicts that under the current system have been decried as impossible. Take the case of the global drug trade. There are currently two centers of drug production on the planet, one in each hemisphere. As expressed by Russian Federal Drug Control Service Director Ivanov, these two centers breed global drug traffic flows, which have encompassed and ensnared practically the entire planet, steadily reshaping the whole globe, undermining stability in a number of transit nations that are too weak to resist, and distorting economic and political processes in the direction of an increase of crime and violence. It is the drugs produced in these centers that supply various regions of the planet with endlessly renewable fuel for extremism, terrorism, and transnational crime. Last year, 5,800 tons of poppy were harvested in Afghanistan, more than 90% of world production. Production of Afghan opium has been multiplied 40 times since Bush began war there in 2001. According to UN figures, 100,000 people are killed per year from the Afghan heroin trade. In the first decade of the 21st century, 1 million people died and 16 million otherwise suffered as a result of Afghan opiates. In Ibero-America, the focus of drug production is cocaine generating 1,000 tons a year, which in market value represents some $200 billion. But according to a study by two Colombian professors, 2.6% of the total street value of cocaine produced remains within Colombia, 
while a staggering 97.4% of profits are reaped by criminal syndicates and laundered by banks in first world consuming countries. The reason that the war on drugs has failed is that the drug money has been necessary to keep the banking system afloat. But likewise, the refusal to stop the drug trade has made available the capital that feeds the financial system's addiction to that dirty money, and has thereby staved off the implementation of a new financial architecture. The billions of dollars that the drug trade injects into the bankrupt financial system through money laundering has been used to recapitalize the financial sector. For example, $100 spent on producing one kilogram of drugs at the point of production becomes a product with a commodity value 1,000 times greater than that once it hits the market in distribution nations. A product with a markup from $100 to $100,000, when the product itself is not only useless to society but is deadly, guarantees an economic catastrophe. Although many sources report that the annual world drug trade is worth about $320 billion, Lyndon LaRouche's Executive Intelligence Review publishers of the famous Dope Incorporated, have found that figure to be quite conservative. In a February 2009 systematic review of published literature, including UNODC reports as well as numerous official U.S. sources, cross-checked with law enforcement and other experts in the field, in the U.S. and other nations, EIR arrived at a conservative figure of $800 billion, and the total today is certainly closer to $1 trillion per year. EIR estimates that when you add in associated criminal activity, such as illegal weapons, contraband, etc., the total drug-linked black economy amounts to two to three trillion dollars per year. The majority of this money is laundered through major financial institutions, and the deregulated offshore banking centers are the engines of this operation. While a significant portion of the drug product is seized, less than one half of one percent of that drug money is confiscated and therefore over 99% of it goes into the financial bubble. The UNODC reports that during the 2008-2009 crisis, approximately 352 billion narco dollars were injected into major banks during crisis points, although that also is probably on the conservative side. The banks, on the point of collapse, were desperate to acquire liquidity, and the drug money was, and still is, one of the last sources of capital in the bankrupt system to feed these institutions. One of the most repugnant cases is that of Wachovia Bank, caught green-handed in laundering Mexican narco dollars during a war by the drug cartels that has killed over 50,000 people since it exploded six years ago. It was exposed in 2010 that Wachovia had laundered $378 billion, the equivalent of one-third of the Mexican GNP. After a 22-month DEA investigation, which also implicated Bank of America, American Express Bank, and HSBC, Wachovia paid a slap-on-the-wrist fine and the charges were dropped. It should be no surprise that this was under the watch of Lanny Brewer and Eric Holder's Department of Justice, whose fast and furious Watergate scandal could bring down the Obama presidency. Furthermore, when Wachovia was absorbed by Wells Fargo, the Sinaloa cartel simply changed banks and started using HSBC. HSBC is now under multiple investigations over drug money laundering and will testify before a U.S. Senate investigative hearing this July 17th, entitled U.S. Vulnerabilities to Money Laundering, Drugs, and Terrorist Financing, HSBC Case History. And the question still remains, how much of the HSBC drug money was funneled into the 2008 Obama presidential campaign? HSBC is reportedly also under investigation for its involvement in the LIBOR rate-fixing scheme. As EIR's Dope Inc. first reported in 1978, HSBC, then called the Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corps, functioned as the central bank for opium and heroin trade for the British Empire and its East India Company, dating back to 1865 when it was founded. And HSBC is not the only one of the Queen's banks involved in drug money laundering. In March 2012, Coots Co., Her Majesty's Bank, was fined by the UK's Financial Services Authority for persistent money laundering. On a six-day visit to three Ibero-American countries, Viktor Ivanov, director of Russia's Federal Drug Control Service, 
denounced the international financial system's shameful enslavement to drug money and called for immediate collaboration between Russia and Ibero-America to shut down drug production and institute a new financial architecture. The Russian drug trade, Ivanov reported, is valued at $10 billion per year, 300 million of which come from cocaine production in Ibero-America, which is 16 times what it was 10 years ago. The Putin Medvedev pro-development government finds a natural ally in an Argentina under President Fernandez, whose commitment to protecting national sovereignty and promoting scientific advancement is at odds with the deadly drug trade. During his South American visit, Ivanov met with various anti-narcotics agency directors of the region, signed an anti-drug cooperation agreement with Peru, and made several proposals for strengthening the Russian-Brazilian anti-drug partnership. Russia and Argentina agreed to exchange operational information about cocaine supply from South America after Ivanov met with Argentine Security Minister Nilda Garre. According to Voice of Russia of July 3rd, the FDCS will set up special training courses for their counterparts in Bolivia, Colombia, Peru, and Ecuador as per bilateral agreements with those nations. Ivanov told his audience at Argentina's Center for International Relations on June 27th that they would like to set up a similar center for all of Latin America. At this conference in Buenos Aires, he outlined a three-step program for eradicating the drug trade. Ivanov called for separating commercial and investment banks to defend credit operations against speculative ones. This is what was prescribed by the 1933 Glass-Steagall Law, and reinstituting that principle today will close the loopholes in the system that make it possible for these deadly monetarist games to function, whether it be through narco-dollars or other insidious methods of economic or physical warfare. And it will open up the possibility for investment in genuine physical economic development. The possibility for elimination of the drug trade is only one facet of this crucial reorganization. This is the only thing that has the potential to succeed if we are to have genuine progress for human civilization, and we must now escalate the fight to ensure victory. <laughs>